Good morning. Yeah, I'm off on Saturdays, so he scared me there. I was like, something new I'm doing now? Um, well, it's great to be here. It's uh, always a privilege to come here and share the Word of God with you guys. Uh, you know, I've, I've known Pastor Mike for a long time. I went to Bible college there at, at Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley, back in 95, I think it was, and I graduated there, and I believe he was one of my teachers there that we had during that time uh, before he got fired and came here. And I'm joking, he does joke. <laughs> No, but I, I've known him for a while, so he's, he's, a, he's a neat guy, and, and, and it's always a, a privilege when, he's, when he asks me to come here and share, uh, you know, in place of him. So um, I'm excited here. Like, like um, Sean was mentioning, you know, I, I am at K-Wave. I'm assistant general manager there, and I also do the uh, Bible study on Sunday nights at Chino Valley Calvary Chapel. And um, so God has kept me busy. I have a, a beautiful wife, Kareen, and I also have two boys, or a little girl and a little boy, was going to be one year old and a, almost a five year old little girl, so it's great to have them. So they keep me busy. Um, so my life is not boring right now. Um, but, anyways, uh, t- today actually I'm going to be teaching out of Nehemiah chapter 6. If you guys turn to Nehemiah chapter 6, and uh, the message this morning I've entitled the message Weapons of Mass Distraction. Weapons of Mass Distraction. And uh, we're going to be looking at chapter 6. I'm going to, because of our time, I probably do a lot of skipping through some of the uh, sections of that chapter, uh, but I will be getting through this uh, text here. Uh, But Nehemiah chapter 6, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read verses 1 through 4, and then I will get into our our study this morning. Nehemiah chapter 6. Now it happened when Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall, and that there were no breaks left in through at that time, uh, left in it, though at that time I had not hung the doors in the gates, that Sambalit and Gisham sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do harm. I, so I sent messengers to them, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? But they sent me this message four times, and I answered them in the same manner. I read recently in the Harvard Business Review, it's an online magazine, and it it was an interesting magazine, uh, 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 actually article, and the actual title of this article was this, Conquering Digital Distraction. You know where I'm going with this one, right? Everybody's putting away their phones right now. The writers, because there were two writers that actually wrote this this uh, article and, and and these writers basically pointed out that many today can be labeled as phobos and fomos you're like what is that i'll explain this to you here in a moment a phobo is a person who is who has a fear of being offline a fomo is fear of missing out now in their research which is pretty interesting to me they found out that many people regardless of age i'm not speaking just to young people They check their smartphones every 15 minutes or less. That's kind of like what they're doing. They become anxious if they're not allowed to do so. So there's always a constant checking of the smartphone. Now, according to these writers, what they were looking at in their research is that people are overly obsessed over the digital things that people have, laptops, iPhones, uh, whatever it is, uh, iPads. There's an overly uh, obsession, this obsession that they have, and it's what they call this digital distraction. So their article is trying to help people overcome or conquer this digital distraction. And what they did, basically, as they, looked at, as they actually looked and researched and they gathered people, they said there are two practical ways that you can conquer digital distraction. One is turn off your phones an hour before you go to bed just one hour before you go to bed. Why? Because the brain at nighttime is supposed to kind of wind down and you're supposed to kind of bring your brain to a place of rest, right? But instead, what we do is we check the phones before we go to bed, which kind of like ramps up your brain, which makes it harder for your brain to rest. So in their article, they said, listen, just don't look at your phones an hour before you, get, you go to bed. And the second thing they said is take the phone out of your bedroom. Because the very first thing that you people do, and I am guilty of this, please, I am not talking here like I am this conqueror of digital distraction here, all right? I, I struggle with this. The first thing you do when you wake up, 
most, most people is they look at their phones. And they say, well, if you can just get off the phone an hour before you go to bed and take it out of your room, you will conquer that digital distraction. And as they were doing this research, it's interesting because I find it that these two ways, I believe they're very interesting ways and they're very practical and perhaps can help people who are overly obsessed with their devices. And as I'm thinking about these digital distractions, and I do want to say this, is that technology in itself is not bad. It's the way you use it and how many times you use it. It becomes bad when you, become, when you get so obsessed with it that it distracts you from everything else. You see this all the time when you go to the mall, right? Uh, people walk through the malls like this with their phones, right? I mean, I was at the mall just this past weekend, and I noticed a lot of people, that's how they walk. And it's like, I have to move out of the way for them. It's like, no, listen, look up. Maybe I'll just bump into them accidentally, right? Oh, well, well, I'm sorry, I thought you were looking. And you see this all the time. People are constantly looking and walking with their phones or whatever they're doing. Uh, you go to Starbucks, which is supposed to be a, a place where you can just hang out. People are what? On their laptop or on their iPhones looking down. Stay home. Throw a pot, pot of coffee. Don't waste money. That's the, 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 uh, the, the, the actual era we're, we're in is this digital distraction. Now, speaking about distraction, and, and yet we can talk all about digital distraction. I'm here to knock down iPhones. I have one. Laptops. I have one. iPads. I'm using one. So I'm not here to knock on that. But I was thinking about just distractions in general. There's another distraction that came to my mind that everyone deals with, even you Christians and non-Christians deal with. It's a distraction that is very hard to just turn off, to be honest with you. It's a distraction that you just can't get out of your bedroom. It's not that easy. And the distraction that I'm talking about, it's all the distractions that the devil will hit you with. Satanically inspired distractions are very hard to turn off, aren't they? And what we see here in the book of Nehemiah in chapter 6, what we're going to see here very clearly is that Nehemiah was hit with tons of distractions. He was continually distracted from what God called him to do. And that is to build the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down. Now, if you've never read the book of Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah is a fascinating book. I encourage you to read it tonight if, if you haven't read it before. Nehemiah, who had a burden for not only God's city, but for God's people, he wanted to see the walls of Jerusalem. After the captivity, the people left Babylon, and only a few went out to the city, and they were able to put together their, their temple. The worship was back, but they had broken walls, and that wasn't good. A city with broken walls was very dangerous because the enemy can come in at any, in any direction. You wouldn't even know. Could you imagine sleeping in your house with your doors open and your windows open every day? Would you feel safe? Absolutely not, right? That's how it was with a city with walls broken down. It's like having the doors and your windows open every night as you go to bed. It was very scary, very dangerous. Nehemiah had a heart for this, and he said, Lord, he prayed, and he asked God for four months to basically, I want to do something about it. But he was stuck working for a Persian king, Artaxerxes. He had a great job. He was in a citadel. He, the guy was making good money. He, he had a good job, but he was stuck there. But even that did not stop him from asking God to do the impossible. And that is, Lord, can you ship me out from this place to go do something? And he, God did. You know the whole story. God moved in the heart of his boss to send him out. And not only that, but God provided all the resources for him and the people to do the work, which is crazy. So when he started the work, as you go through those chapters up to chapter 6, we see that Nehemiah was opposed, constantly opposed by two people, Sambalit and Tobias. Both of these guys were basically big distractions in his life. Now what is distraction? What is the common definition of distraction? Here it is. Distraction is a drawing away or diverting attention away. Did you know that the devil will use people to distract you or to draw you or, 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 or drive you away from Christ? Did you know that? It could be a boyfriend. It could be a girlfriend. It could be a coworker. It could even be a neighbor. The devil will use people to come into your life to distract you 
from serving Jesus Christ. It's happened before in my life, and I'm sure you probably have seen that in your life, and perhaps right now there's somebody in your life that you're like, yes, this person is constantly distracting me from Christ because I just, I'm getting mad at this person. This is becoming a problem. And now your, 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 your spiritual vision is very fuzzy because of this person. There's a huge distraction that the devil is using in your life. Tobiah, Tobiah Sambalit, and we're going to see here in chapter 6, a third person by the name of Geshem. But Nehemiah, so far, he's conquered discouragement. He's conquered strife among his people. And now he's going to deal with some distractions. And he was constantly opposed by three men. I like what one person said about opposition. He said this, A certain amount of opposition is a great help to a man. Kites rise against, not with, the wind. And I find that interesting because God will allow opposition in our lives. And you're saying, well, why would he do that? Well, the reason why he allows opposition in our lives is because one of the things he wants to reveal to you in your personal life is where you are spiritually by the way you handle the opposition. It's where you are spiritually. How do you handle opposition? At work, at home, among your friends, in your marriage? The way you handle opposition will show where you're at as far as spiritually speaking. Nehemiah kept moving forward. Nehemiah did not allow the opposition to stop him. The distractions was really high, very strong, but he continued to do the work for the Lord. And this is something that we learned from Nehemiah. And what I want to share with you this morning, I want to share with you four things that will conquer satanically inspired distractions. Let's look at the first one. Number one, verses one through four, spiritual discernment. Notice what it says in verse one. It happened when some ballot to buy at Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, though at that time I had not hung the doors in the gates. That some ballot in Geshem sent to me saying, come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. Interesting valley name, huh? Oh no, it's them again. Three against one, not fair, right? Come on, three against one. Nehemiah is all by himself and these guys, first it was just some ballad and Tobiah, now there's one more. It's like, we can't get this guy down. We can't bring this guy down. Let's add another person. Now it's three against one. What were they doing to Nehemiah? Well, they were mocking Nehemiah. They were mocking the Jews who were working on the wall, trying to discourage him from the work. They also were trying to mess with their heads by putting doubts and mocking their efforts. When they said that even if a fox went on top of that wall, they would crumble, questioning the quality of their work. So they were messing with their minds. And now we see here that the enemy uses a different approach in his attack, one that is very deceptive and appear to be good. But Nehemiah was not ignorant. He knew something was up. He wasn't gullible. He wasn't a gullible person. This is where spiritual discernment kicks in. This is what's important. What is spiritual discernment? What are you talking about? Well, spiritual discernment is this, the ability to judge matters according to God's view of them and not according to their outward appearance. Why is spiritual discernment important in the Christian life? Let me tell you why. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. Listen to this. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as what? An angel of light. In the Bible, light and darkness usually represents good and evil. The devil masquerades as something good? We're in trouble because he's very good at it. Listen, Christians, you have to pray for spiritual discernment. It's important. That we're not gullible by what we hear or what we see. Because the enemy himself will masquerade as an angel of light. You see his ultimate deception through the Antichrists. In fact, would you guys turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let me just share this with you real quickly. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 9 and 10. The Antichrist will basically be the most deceptive work that Satan has ever done on earth. 
And notice what it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. Right there, that should just like perk your ears up like, whoa. And notice what he's going to do. According to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders. And with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Here it is. A non-Christian that rejects the truth of Christ will believe anything else. Satan is there. He will give them truth, false truth. He will package it in a very subtle way that to them, it looks really good. See, I'm spiritual. I, I'm just like you Christians. I, I worship God as well. But see, but my God is in my tree in the backyard, and I go hug it every morning. See, to them, that's truth. It's spiritual. It makes them feel good. But you see, we see very clearly that the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Spiritual discernment will conquer satanically inspired distractions. Paul said this, 2 Corinthians 2.11, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We are not ignorant of his devices. Listen, Satan wants us to think that he is good, truthful, loving, and powerful. That's how he portrays himself. All the things that God is. Remember Eve in the Garden of Eden? Satan appeared to her, and first thing he said to her, did God really say that? Did he really, really say that? It's like, let's have a theology discussion here, Eve. Let's talk about this. I, I'm not denying what God said, but, but let's, let's, maybe you got the wrong interpretation. Oh, did he really say that? Began to mess with her head. See, we see that the enemies here against Nehemiah had an outward appearance of innocence. Hey, Nehemiah, let's hang out. Let's talk about this. It's almost like someone said, hey, let's go hang out at Starbucks. I want to talk about Jesus with you. You're like, hmm. Really? I don't know. I think you just want to date me. You know what I mean? I think you're just, you're just trying to get something else from me. And all of a sudden, we see that Nehemiah is not giving into it. You know, one person that comes to my mind who was so phony, so fake, was Herod. Listen to this. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 8, he wanted to kill all the children. Remember? Two and under. This is what he said to the Magi's, the three wise men. Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. <laughs> liar? What did he wanted to do? He wanted to kill him. Herod was a liar. He did not want to worship Jesus. He wanted to kill Jesus. And there are people that say, hey, I'll, I'll worship Jesus with you. And they have something else in mind. They have something else up their sleeves. And the only way you're going to understand that or know that is by having that spiritual discernment. To be very careful. There are people that can talk like Christians, act like Christians, but when they are behind closed doors, you find out that they're not true Christians. Here's an area that I find a lot of phoniness. Not that I myself have ever done this, but the reason why I'm bringing this up because I've had a lot of people that I've known that have gone here online dating, right? Not against it. I'm just, just listen. I've had, my wife and I have talked to many young people that have gone through this and Online dating, it's like, you know, your, your profile is immaculate, right? I mean, you are the perfect person. And if it's under the banner of Christianity, you are a godly person. Your picture is beautiful, right? All dolled up and everything, right? You're just like, you look great. Everything that you do, your job, I mean, you make it so cool. So then you have the Christian who will say, hey, I like your photo. I'd like to do, you know, go out with you and get to know you. And all of a sudden, they meet somewhere. And you wouldn't believe it, guys, how many people I've spoken with that after that first gathered gathering, whatever you want to call it, they come out with their eyes peeled back like this person was not a Christian. But they portrayed themselves to be a Christian because they're trying to get Christians. You know, back in high school, I had a friend of mine who was not a Christian. I wasn't even a Christian in high school. I just got saved yesterday. No, I'm joking. No. I, I, in high school, I was not a Christian. I was a pagan. I was just out there messing around with my friends 
And I remember I had a friend of mine who was close to me who purposely dated Christian women without any intentions of him becoming a Christian because he, he liked the purity that was in a Christian woman. Now, a real true Christian woman would not date a non-Christian. Let me just say that. But these so-called Christian women that he would actually meet and date were basically backsliders or uh, you know, girls that, that were underneath the roof of a pastor, you know, dad or, or whatever it is. But, but he targeted Christian women. Isn't that sick? A lot of that out there today. And we see very clearly that one of the ways that you can really put somebody on the spot, if, you want, if you're questioning whether they are really Christians, ask them what their God story is. What is your testimony? How did you become a Christian? Right there, you'll know where they're at. Because if they're like, well, I've been a Christian all my life. I've been a Christian. Ah, the, the moment I opened my eyes, I was a Christian. Or, oh, I'm a Christian because my parents take me to church. Or I'm a Christian because I live in a house that my dad is. All of a sudden, you get that kind of response. You're like, oh, boy. Let me give you the gospel, buddy. This is how you come to, how, how you come to the Lord. Spiritual discernment. Don't be so gullible. It's sad now in America that when somebody says, I'm a Christian, the first thing in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, um, what church do you go to? I mean, it's sad we have to do that. In the book of Acts, you didn't have to worry about that. It's like, you say you're a Christian, you were a Christian. In fact, people did not want to become a Christian because of the persecution. Like, I'm not going to go there. But in America, everybody wants to be a Christian, right? It, what's the word Christian in America? The word Christian in America basically means that you're just a good person. Oh, what a good Christian. I'm a good Christian. They think that you're just you're doing good deeds. But that's not the definition of a Christian. We know that, right? It's a follower of Christ, somebody who's connected to Jesus, somebody who honors him, who lives for him on a daily basis. Not perfect, but strives to honor him and please him every day. What we see here, Nehemiah was not a gullible person. And notice what he said. Here's the spiritual discernment, verse 2. He says, basically, he made it very clear. He says, they thought to do me harm. He knew, he knew right away. It's like, you guys have been against the work of God, and now you want to hang out with me? Uh-uh, there's something wrong here. I'm not going to buy it. They went after the main leader. So the very first thing for us to conquer satanically inspired distractions is to have spiritual discernment. The second thing, stay focused. Stay focused. Notice verses 3 and 4. He stayed focused. He said to them very clearly, he says, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? Isn't that focused there? He was focused. Like, I'm not going to go off. And I know what you want to do. I need to stay focused on what God is calling me to do here. I want to look. I want to do the work of the Lord. He knew they were trying to distract him from completing the work. And again, that's another way that the enemy attacks us. He wants to draw us away from serving Christ. The devil tried to do that to our own Jesus. Matthew chapter 4. You remember the devil took Jesus up on a high mountain, showed him the world, the, the glitter of the world, says, listen, if you just bow down before me, all this is yours. And of course, Jesus says, no way. Trying to distract Jesus, trying to draw him away from the cross, he says, nope. Four times Jesus said no, 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 using God's word to battle that warfare. He did not give in. The devil will use practical things in our lives, not just people. He can use our jobs against us. He can use our jobs to distract us. And sometimes, you know, we have to work, we have to do things, but sometimes we get so obsessed with our jobs that we, sometimes it hinders our walk with Christ. We don't have time to serve Jesus. I, I, I'm a busy man. I'm always out and about. You know, I got, you know, no, there's, there's got to be some leeway there for you to have your opportunity to serve Christ. But, but he'll use our jobs, even trials to keep us from moving forward, from keeping us uh, from, from Jesus. We need to stay focused on God's word. Stay focused on what is right. Stay focused on what God has called you to do. And, and he's called you, your, your, your general calling is to glorify God in your life. And that comes in different ways. And one way is the fellowship. One way is serving Him. Serving Him with your gifts. Focus on that. And notice He says in verse 4, He says, four times He says, 
I've told them the same answer four times. In other words, Nehemiah basically said, nope, 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 nope. He did not try to explain himself. He did not try to reason with them. He was straight out. He told them that you guys are up to no good. So have spiritual discernment. Stay focused. Number three, fear God, not man. Fear God, not man. Verse five, notice. Sambalat sent his letter, I'm sorry, sent his servant to me as before, the fifth time, with an open letter in his hand. Now, let me share this with you. An open letter, there's a significance to that. An open letter meant that anyone can read the letter. And in that letter, there were these false accusations against him. Most letters were sealed. This one was purposely opened. Isn't that interesting? So everybody can read it. Huh? Nehemiah's doing what? This is not good. False accusation. It's like Facebook nowadays, isn't it? You have a problem with someone? What happens? You see this all the time on the wall. That person starts ranting about them without using their name. Oh, I can't stand people that do this or that and this and that. And the person that... They're writing about, even though their name's not, they begin to read it like, that's about me. We just had an argument about this. It's like, really, just send them a private message. Deal with it. Instead, let's just throw it on the wall so everybody can see it and get all my fans to like me and to say, yes, you're right. That's what happened here. I'm going to keep this letter open so everyone can see it. And Nehemiah here is being falsely accused of things that weren't true. What were they? Well, let me give you what they were. One, from verses 6 through 7, one is that he was planning a revolt. Two, that he wanted to be their king. There was already a king. And three, that he set up false prophets to support his cause. That's what that letter said. So they're trying to bring him down with these three things that were false. He's gathering the Jews to come against Nehemiah. And we see that here very clearly that if the king heard about these accusations, he would have felt betrayed and lied to because Nehemiah made it clear to him that he wanted to go just to rebuild the wall, not to, you know, to start a revolt, not to try to be a king. And could you imagine Artaxerxes, his king, his boss, who allowed him to go there, would have been like, well, Nehemiah did not tell me that he wanted to do all these things. He tricked me. That's what these guys wanted to see this king do think about so we see clearly that nehemiah was hit, getting hit big time he was being false, falsely accused and when you're falsely accused it's not a good feeling is it i mean you want to retaliate don't you i mean you know it's not true and you want to say something back you want to say oh yeah well let me draw uh, basically drag your name on, uh, in the mud as well and you want to fight them you want to do something about it it weighs heavy on your mind it paralyzes you mentally physically and even spiritually that's a distraction all of a sudden well how does nehemiah handle these harsh accusations verse 8 and 9 notice how he handles it i sent to him saying no such thing as you say are being done but you invent them in your own hearts for they are all for for they all were trying to make us afraid saying their hands will be weakened in the work and it will not be done. And then he says there, Now therefore, O oh God, strengthen my hands. I love it. He says, You guys are crazy. You're making this stuff up. And after he tells them this, he just goes to God and says, Okay, Lord, I need your help. False accusations. What do you do? You go to God. Lord, can you please help me in here? You know they're not true, Lord, but these guys are really bad. False accusations is expected in the Christian life. Did you know that? And it's expected in the Christian life. Jesus told us that. Listen to what he said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 11. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil things against you falsely for my sake. Welcome to Christianity. Maybe your co-worker's talking stuff about you, like, Wait a minute, I, I didn't do that. I didn't say that. Hey, listen, your Jesus prepared you for that. False accusations 
sometimes are expected in the Christian life. We have to be careful with that. In Acts chapter 6, verse 13, Paul says, They also set up false witness who said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. That was a lie. That wasn't what Paul was doing. False accusation. So how does God want you to handle it? When you're being falsely accused at work, perhaps at home, perhaps even at church, how do you handle it? Well, listen to this. Proverbs 26.20 gives us some good, good wisdom. Where there is no wood, the fire goes out. And, there, and where there is no talebearer, strife ceases. What does that mean? Listen, don't feed the fire. Don't feed the fire. If you want the fire to go out, you don't give in to the, you, don't give, you don't give it more wood. You stop giving it wood and then it will die. When it comes to gossip and false accusations against you, it will die out when you just don't feed it. Leave it alone. Let, let it go and guess what? Give it to God. That's what Nehemiah did. Let, let the Lord handle that. I always tell people that if you take care of your character, God will take care of your reputation. You just take care of your character. Know what God has called you to live, your integrity and all of that stuff. If you could take care of your character, listen, God will take care of your reputation. Falsely accused of this or that, listen, you know that you're in the right spot with the Lord, and he knows that. He'll take care of your reputation. That's exactly what happened to Nehemiah. His heart was pure. Yeah, he said to them, you guys are crazy. I'm not going to meet with you. You guys are liars. And then he goes to God, Lord, strengthen my hands, please. Help me here. He, let it, he left it to the Lord. Nehemiah had nothing to worry about. He knew who he was. He knew what he was called to do. God answered his prayer. God knew his heart. So there was no, nothing to worry about. And the same thing goes for you and for me. If those accusations are false and they're wrong, listen, be at peace because you know, and between you and the Lord, that's not true. That's wrong. That's a lie. And you keep moving forward. All that they were wanting to do in verse 9 was to scare Nehemiah. False accusations will usually cause fear in our hearts. And that's exactly what he said. He says, you know what? What they're trying to do is make us afraid. Because if I'm afraid, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm done working here. This is too hard. And we see that Nehemiah understood that they wanted to scare him. It was a scare tactic. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. A.B. Simpson, who's an author, wrote this, Fear is born of Satan, and if we would only take time to think a moment, we would see that everything Satan says is founded upon falsehood. Satan is a father of lies, isn't he? There's nothing good in him. Now, it's sad that when we look at the devil in our modern age, when we think of the devil, if you go to a non-Christian and you say to them, well, tell me what comes to your mind when I, tell you, when I say the word devil, most of the time they'll say, well, red suits, pitchfork, a tail, right? Horns and fire coming out of his mouth, right? That's the Hollywood version of the devil. The devil does not wear a red suit. The devil is a spiritual being who was kicked out of heaven because he wanted to be like God. And now he is seriously upset, knows that his time is short, and he wants to deceive and bring as many people to hell as possible because his time is very short. He knows his end. And we see very clearly that when we fear doing something for God, think for a moment and ask yourself, is this Jesus or is this Satan that's scaring me? Is it the Lord or is it Satan? Why am I afraid of wanting to do more for Jesus? Why am I afraid of going to church another day? Is that really God saying, don't go to church, stay home? Okay, I'm going to stay home. That was the Lord. We need to have that discernment that we talked about earlier. 1 John 4, 18 says, There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. You know, the love of God does not torment you. The love of God is good, like the song that we sang this morning. God is good. God is not into tormenting you at all. You torment yourself, or you allow the enemy to torment yourself, yourself basically. 
Because if you're living a life that's not according to God's will, then yeah, you're going to go through some condemnation and the enemy is just taking advantage of that. And we see clearly here that fear is part of life. We know that. But we must bring our fears to the Lord. Sift them through Him. Max Lucado said, The presence of fear does not mean you have no faith. Fear visits everyone, but make sure your fear is a visitor and not a resident. I love that. Nehemiah did not allow fear to reside with him long term. I'm sure he was scared, but it wasn't something that he allowed to just move into his life. He did the right thing. What was that? He went to God with his fear, and he said, Oh God, strengthen my hands. God, give me the strength to carry on. Kind of reminds me of what Paul said when he was ministering and missionary uh, in his missionary journey. He said in Philippians 4.13, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's God who strengthens me. Nehemiah is there. Nehemiah is being pushed. And we see, though, that in verses 10 through 14, we see that Nehemiah now is being scared or the scare tactics by basically saying things that were wrong prophetically, false prophets. Verse 12, notice what it says. Then it says, Then I perceived that God had not sent him at all, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalit had hired him. For this reason he was hired, that I should be afraid and act that way and sin, so that they might have cause for an evil report, that they might reproach me. They might reproach me. And I love what he says in verse 14. My God, remember Tobiah and Sambalit according to their works, and the prophetess no- Noadiah, and the rest of the prophets who would have made me afraid. That's pretty interesting. He says that God had not sent him at all. Nehemiah had, again, great spiritual discernment. He knew that these guys weren't speaking for God. They were contradicting, opposing the work of God. When somebody comes to you and says, the Lord told me, you, I'm like, oh boy, where's this going? When somebody comes to you and says, thus says the Lord, you're to marry me. Whoa! Well, listen, God has got my number too. Let me, let me, let me, let me figure this one out. We, got, we have to be careful because even among Christians, we tend to kind of speak prophetically and, and, and sometimes we're wrong. You know, you know what? I just feel like the Lord wanted me to say this to you. That, that you remember, I, I don't even go there unless I honestly, and, and there's a conviction in my heart that God has really laid on my heart something to say to you. But you will never hear from me to go to, I, I, and in fact, I haven't done it much. There have been sometimes I'll just share with my wife certain things, but I, I, I'm afraid to just go to somebody unless God has really moved in my heart to say, you know what? I want to say something that God has told me about you. I want to be 100% sure that it was God moving in my heart. Because if, it was, if it's not God, I'm, I'm, I'm being a false prophet. And I do not want to be in that area there. Nehemiah had some interesting things happen. We see clearly here that it's important for him to understand that these guys weren't speaking for God. You know, we see this even in television. I call them religious psychics where they bring people up and they start prophesying over them. And God told me that you're going to be driving a Beamer the, you know, in two weeks and you're going to have a husband. I mean, all of a sudden, all this stuff, and they're like, yes, praise the Lord. You know what I mean? I'd like to go back to them and say, did that happen? I guarantee you, like, no, I'm not even a Christian now because of that. We have to be careful in how we talk to each other. And, and we see it very clearly here that there's deceiving spirits. First John 4, 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. I mean, I've had people come to me and say things like that. You know, Robert, I want to share something that I just, you know, and when they share that with me, it's not too far from what God has already been speaking to me. So I can say to them, amen, you are being used by the Lord right now. There there have been times that God has, uh, people have said things, Christians have come to me and and I guess if you want to call it prophesy uh, over my life and stuff, and, and, and in my heart I'm thinking, that's what I've been praying that's something that I was just dealing with the Lord. So I know this is, this, is, this is genuine here. But if it's something that is off the wall, something that is not even close to where I'm at with the Lord, then I have to kind of look at it in two ways. One, 
they're not really speaking for the Lord. Or two, okay, Lord, then you're going to speak to me very soon about this. And if you don't, then they're just, it was just their flesh. Maybe it was just an emotion that they got that you just came and laid it on me. That's what happened here with, with Nehemiah. Nehemiah goes to God again. He says, Lord, take care of my enemies. And notice he says, the prophetess Noadiah. You know, this, this prophetess here, we don't have much information here except for here. And the name means one to whom the Lord revealed himself. It's sad that here she's being used against Nehemiah. And her name is not going well here right now. The definition of her name, that is. She was a false prophet trying to convince Nehemiah perhaps that it wasn't God's will for him to be where he's at. You know, again, we got to be careful with us, you know, among ourselves, that when we tell somebody, you know, I don't think God is really calling you to do this. Do you, do, really? You know, I had a situation many, many years ago. I, I pastored a church in Upset, New York. And I was up there for 10 years. I planted a Calvary Chapel. Church is still there, doing well. And I remember when we first planted the church, we were doing Bible studies at my house, and we were also fellowshipping with a pastor at a Baptist church. And he really liked us, my wife and I. We had no children at the time, but he really liked you know, you know, us and, and the ministry and whatnot. And, and he really was looking uh, at me as, as their new youth director. I think he wanted me to do stuff with the youth, with the young people. But I, I knew that I was called to go out there and plant a church. I was there called as a pastor. And I remember when I started doing my Bible studies and, and it was growing and all this, I remember I had a conversation with him. And the conversation was this. He basically said to me that he, 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 we need to be with him. And when he said that to me, I said to him, okay. I said, let me ask you a question. Did God say that to you? And he got quiet. He said, no. That's all I wanted to know. Because if he said to me, yes, the Lord told me that you need to be with us and you're not here to plant a church, then I would have probably went back and prayed a little more and said, Lord, is this true? But the fact that he was honest to say, no, God did not say this to me. It's, it was his flesh. It was just, I just want you to be on my church, in my church. I don't want you to plant another church. And we see here that Noadiah is probably somebody like this who, who was just acting like this prophetess, and Nehemiah is saying, this person's phony. She's not being real. All these things that were coming against Nehemiah, none of those things prospered, which reminds me of Isaiah 54, 17, that no weapon formed against you will prosper. When you're right there with the Lord, you're doing the work that, you, that God has called you to do. Listen, things will come against you. Opposition, distractions, but if you stay focused, you stay focused on the Lord and what he's called you to do, you're going to conquer these things. Well, Nehemiah in verses 15 through 19, as we're coming to the end here, the walls were done. Verse 15, 52 days for these walls to be done, completed. And when that was done, notice, it says very clearly there that the enemies, this is when they finished the walls, it says that these things, when they saw these things, they were very disheartened in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was done by God. <laughs> so the enemies are like, man, that's a bummer. Knowing that it was God's work. Kind of like Jonah. Remember Jonah? when he ran away from God because he did not want to go out there and evangelize the Assyrians because they were barbaric. Those guys were horrible. If you think ISIS is bad, read the history of the Assyrians. Those guys were terrible in what they did to people. And, he, and, he, and Jonah says, I don't want to go there. And then you know the whole story. I'm not going to go through the whole story. But what happened at the end? God used them, right? Big revival, Nineveh. And then he sat down upset and says, I knew God you were going to be so merciful. I knew you were merciful and long-suffering. I just knew that. That's why I didn't want to go in the first place, because you were going to give them a chance to repent. How sad. And here these guys are saying, you know what? That's a bummer. They finished. We try to do everything in our power to try to distract Nehemiah and the people from rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem so that people can stay in distress. And now they're bummed. They're like, man, thanks, God. <laughs> can you imagine how weird it is? Thanks, God. That just doesn't make sense. Well, let me close with a few things. You will, in, you will encounter distractions in your Christian life. You're going to encounter them. And perhaps there are some things that are probably already distracting you in your life today. That's something that you've got to be prepared for. The devil wants to draw you away from Christ. He wants to draw you away from serving him. He wants to draw you away from fellowshipping with him. 
He wants to draw you away from living for Christ. That's his goal when he distracts you. You need to know your opponent. Know your opponent. Don't be ignorant of Satan's devices. Don't be ignorant of his devices. Nehemiah knew his opponent very well. They wanted to stop him from building the walls of Jerusalem. Paul the apostle knew the enemy very, very well. And he was opposed daily. Jesus said that Satan comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. Did you see that? It doesn't say there that he comes to steal, kill, and hug. To steal, kill, and destroy. That's his goal. That's what he wants. You have to stay focused in the Christian life. Especially nowadays, we have so many distractions. So much distraction. The moment you walk out of this place, you've been here for 40 minutes listening to a message. You're going to walk out of here and somebody's going to cut you off. You're like, that's it. That just blows the whole thing, right? You're like, man, and you're upset for the rest of the day. You just got distracted from whatever Jesus said to you this morning. We have to be on our guard. We, we have to be focused. Distractions are very dangerous. We have a law today that forbids you and me from using cell phones and texting while driving. That law is important, right? Because if you do it, if you're driving distractedly, what happens? You can crash. You can kill yourself or somebody else. And there's been cases already where young people have been texting while driving and they don't realize there's a big rig in front of them and they crash full speed into them and they pass away and they die. And they realize that they were texting at the time. Distractions are dangerous. And let me say this about Christ. Imagine living the Christian life distracted. That's dangerous too. That is very dangerous. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. My encouragement to you this morning is to stay focused. Protect your relationship with Christ. Don't let the enemy distract you. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, it's so easy to say these things, and we know that we are surrounded by just distractions. And Lord, it's, it's hard sometimes. We, we, we don't see the distractions. We think that, 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 that the distraction is a good thing. Perhaps we think it's from you. But Lord, sometimes it's not. And Jesus, we need your help. Just like Nehemiah went to you. As, as you have your heads down, your eyes closed, I want to pray for you this morning. If you're here this morning and you're saying, Robert, I'm, I'm just a distracted individual. My, my relationship with Jesus is not where it should be. I do need help. If that's you, raise your hand. Let me pray for you. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. Father, I pray for those that raised their hand and they're saying, Lord, I need help. Lord, if it's spiritual discernment that they need, I pray that you give it to them. Lord, if, if it's... If it's Staying focused. Maybe they, they, they go off track very easily by a trial, by maybe by, by their job, or maybe it could be a relationship. Whatever it is, Lord, I pray that you help them stay focused. Remind them of your goodness. Remind them of, of, of their purpose. And Lord, strengthen them as they walk out of this place, Lord, today, that whatever is distracting them or whatever has been distracting them, will no longer be a distraction. And even if it comes back again at the end of the week, Lord, they're going to have the strength by the power of the Holy Spirit to conquer it from what they've learned here today. So, Father, we thank you for your love and your faithfulness towards us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.